Let me start our recording here. Um, welcome uh, everyone to the Religious Studies Lecture Series in the Department of Classics and Religion here at the University of Calgary. Uh, my name is Joy Palacios. I'm an assistant professor in the department on the Religious Studies side and a member of the Research Committee, uh, which organizes the Religious Studies Lecture Series as well as the Classics um, Lecture Series. And we are really pleased today to have uh, Professor uh, Robert Gleave here as our speaker to launch the winter um, part of our religious studies lecture series. I'm going to begin with the land acknowledgement and then I'll, I'll give a formal introduction for Professor Gleave before we um, uh, get started. So I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Hikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Tsutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Um, Professor Gleave, we're really uh, pleased to have you here, as I said. Uh, professor Gleave is uh, uh, the Professor of Arabic Studies at the University of Exeter in the UK, where he directs two research centers, the Center for the Study of Islam and the International Institute for Cultural Inquiry. Um, as uh, those roles suggest, he is a specialist of Islam, especially Islamic legal theory, legal hermeneutics, and the history of Shiite legal thought and institutions. He has an extremely extensive list of publications. Uh, of the 12 books, if I counted correctly, he has authored or edited. Uh, the most recent is a two volume project on violence in Islamic thought. Um, with the University of Edinburgh Press um, in 2015 and 2018. Um, the first of those volumes looks at violence uh, from uh, the Quran to the Mongols, and then the second uh, volume looks at violence from the Mongols to European imperialism. Um, of his 14 articles and 45 book chapters, if I counted those correctly too, um, two of the most recent include a chapter on understanding divine intention in Islamic legal theory, and a forthcoming article on Akbarism and anti-Sunni polemic during the reigns of Shah Abbas and the great and Shah Safi. Um, in addition to his many publications, uh, Professor Gleave has also won and directed numerous research grants. Uh, currently, he is principal investigator uh, on the project Law, Authority, and Learning in Imami Shiite um, Islam, which is a five-year project, uh, an advanced award from the European Research Council, previous uh, research projects, um, in addition to the work on violence uh, that I already mentioned, have looked at uh, British imams going green, Islam and water management in a changing climate, and understanding Sharia. Uh, so we're really pleased to have you here with us today, uh, Professor Gleave. Uh, today, Professor's Gleave, uh, Pro Professor Gleave's talk, as you can see, is titled Law, Politics, and Magic in Islam, The Strange Case of uh, Mirza Muhammad Nisaburi. Um, I'm going to pass uh, it to you, Professor Gleave, and um, after uh, his talk, then we'll have time for some question and answers at the end. Well, thank you very much, Joy, and uh, thank you very much, everyone at the uh, University of Calgary for hosting me this e evening. Um, well, it's evening where I am. I know it's lunchtime where you are. It's around about five minutes past ten in the evening, and... Um, I'm normally in bed in about 25 minutes. So um, if I start getting sleepy, just someone shout at me to keep me awake. Um, hopefully it'll be me that's getting sleepy and not you, but we'll see about that. Um, uh, I wanna talk a little bit today about a new area of research which I'm working on. Um, and uh, it's probably a bit of a risk. I, I probably should have brought something which I've done a hundred thousand times, but I thought I'd try and introduce something a little that I'm working on more recently and that I've not actually presented on before, which is looking at the way in which um, law, politics and magic intertwine in the Islamic tradition. And in particular, I'm interested in this person who I'm going to introduce to you a little bit later on, Mirza Mohammed Nisaburi, who um, uh, was a, uh, a scholar from India who traveled to um, uh, Iraq and Iran and uh, studied there uh, and got embroiled in the politics of the region as well as um, being renowned for certain magical practices. So I'll turn to him at the end, but let me try and introduce what I'm planning to do 
in the next uh, uh, few minutes that I've got with you. So first of all, I wanted to introduce something about magic, which is normally comes under the term sihr in uh, the Islamic tradition. So sihr uh, is the term which is used more, most generally for magic. And I'll introduce a little bit about that. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the evaluation of sihr in the Muslim tradition. So in particular, how it's evaluated in the Islamic legal tradition. That is how Islamic law views sihr and those who practice it and what it has to say about that. And then finally, I'll turn to the case of Mirza Muhammad Nisaburi, um, who died in 1817 or 1818. Uh, we're not entirely sure about the dates. There's conflicting reports. Um, but um, uh, he is a person which sort of combines magic politics and law, uh, uh, as well as being a very interesting uh, thinker and in his own right. So let me move on to how it all started for me. So in 2011, in May 2011, President, President Ahmadinejad of Iran was accused of sorcery by many within the Iranian establishment. Now, it's not the usual thing to accuse a president of sorcery. He was accused of sihr. And um, there was a lot of discussion around what what this might mean. In fact, some of the leading clerics of the day, such as Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, said that he was 90% certain that Ahmadinejad was under the influence of sihr, i.e. The, under the influence of sorcerers and sorcery. Um, it was clear that there was a campaign against Ahmadinejad from some parts within the uh, Iranian establishment, uh, and that he uh, and some of his actions had managed to annoy some of those within the establishment. And that one of the reasons why they were going to be able to pick on him was because he was accused of um, or consorting with people within his um, close circle who had in their past possibly been associated with magical practices. In particular, there was Isfandiyar Rahim Mashai, who was his chief of staff, and he was um, seen as one of the prime people who were interested in magical practices and other forms of, uh, of divination. And Hujat Islam Abbas Amir Rifar, who was, um, uh, who was a prayer leader to and a religious confidant of uh, President Ahmadinejad. And uh, here we have a picture of him with uh, President Ahmadinejad. And he was also accused of being really a, a, too interested in what you might call um, unorthodox magical practices. And this was a very interesting sort of political event. Um, and it sparked my interest in to try and discover a little bit more about how magic, or more precisely, sihr has been viewed with this Islamic legal thinking, because I hadn't spent that much time looking at this particular area of Islamic law before. And um, clearly, in order to understand the, the power of this um, attack on Ahmadinejad, you had to understand a little bit about the reputation for magic and sihr within the Islamic tradition. So there are different kinds of magic. This is not a reference to uh, Freddie Mercury, although um, uh, Freddie Mercury actually came from a Zoroastrian background. Um, and um, uh, we get the word magic precisely from majus, um, being the uh, word in the Eastern languages for the Zoroastrians, but the different kinds of magic in Islam. So Ibn Khaldun, who is known as probably one of the main theorists, I might, might say, of uh, Islamic civilization, um, writing in the uh, um, late uh, 14th, early 15th century, he um, writes in his Muqaddimah, which was a, a work he wrote, as an, his in, introduction to history. He wrote a series of um, analyses of human society, which have been hugely influential in the Islamic tradition. Uh, people have said that it's sort of like the beginnings of anthropology within the Islamic tradition. And amongst the things which he looks at is magic. And he says that there are three types of magic practiced by um, uh, magical souls, as he calls them, and nafusa sahira. First of all, there's exercising influence through mental power. And this is what he calls sihr in its purest form. Then there is exercising influence through numbers and objects and the manipul manipulation of celestial spheres. Um, this is a uh, tilismat, 
from where we get the term talisman in, uh, in uh, English. And thirdly, there's exerting influence through mental manipulation, and this is really trickery. Shawa, that is how he calls it in Arabic, and it, it's, he really views it as um, people tricking uh, others into believing things which haven't happened. This tripartite definition of magic has been very influential in the Islamic tradition and has been used and cited over and over again. And you'll see it coming through in some of the descriptions of magic in the Islamic legal texts. But magic generally in the Islamic tradition is viewed as um, uh, effects whose causes are hidden. And hence it's called um, al-ulum al khafiya hidden sciences or the occult sciences. Um, and it covers a whole range of different practices within the Islamic tradition. You have talismans, which are um, uh, acquire spiritual power through the uh, prayers that are written on them and the incantations that are said during their construction. You have extremely common um, wearing of phylactery type um, uh, boxes in which there is copies of the Quran and other um, prayers in boxes and uh, uh, scroll tubes such as these. You have an enormous number of um, astrological works written over the centuries talking about how the, the planets and their movement can be can influence the activity of uh, human beings on Earth and how that might be harnessed for good and how that might be understood as a uh, as a mechanism for predicting the fu future. You have a long tradition of what's sometimes called letterism and numerology, which is uh, a mechanism whereby numbers and letters are accorded particular power when they are arranged in a particular format. And in the um, Arabic texts that describe this, they, they outline how every letter of the Arabic alphabet has a numerical equivalent. And so letterism and numerology come very close to each other in the uh, Islamic tradition. Uh, because letters represent numbers as well as numbers representing numbers. And uh, the squares that you see on this slide are a very common magic square um, uh, formula, which is used uh, for particular, um, uh, for harnessing particular spiritual powers. And you will see them used throughout Muslim civilization and outside of Muslim civilization as well, um, in order to uh, explain and control spiritual forces. Um, sorry, just moved one bit too far there. But So you have a common practice moving into the present day. These are all still practices which, which, which you can find within the Muslim community. You have um, uh, spells, incantation and exorcism being carried out uh, by uh, Muslim uh, practitioners. Uh, those who recognize themselves who have been um, possessed in one way by a spirit or a jinn, and these can be uh, uh, controlled through um, the performance of particular rites. Um, and it's moved into the digital age as well. You can have a app on your phone which will choose at random for you a verse from the Quran, and through that, you will be able to know whether what you're about to do is a good idea or a bad idea. This is normally comes under the umbrella term of istikhara, um, selecting at random a verse from the Quran to see whether it tells you whether a decision you're about to make is a good one or a bad one. And basically a form of, of prophecy uh, through random selection of verses in the Quran. It's been a very popular practice throughout all of Muslim civilization just about. We find it in the very earliest texts described as a, a legitimate practice and a, a means whereby you can, um, you can discover the correctness or otherwise of your actions. 
Um, and it's moved into the digital age with, a, with an app that will do it for you, picking out a random uh, word if you need it. So under the term of Sihr or magic more broadly, you have in the Islamic tradition, spells, incantations, physiognomy. This is the, this is the notion that by, um, by the, uh, the shape and um, appearance of someone's face, you can, you can tell um, much about them in terms of their personality and their fate um, in this world and the next. Palmistry, astrology, dream interpretation, alchemy, letterism and numerology, geomancy, uh, including the uh, use of sand uh, or um, throwing stones at random onto the ground to see how they fall in order to be able to predict the future. So all of these are, you will find them in many different Muslim contexts and you will have, you, you find them in the historical texts stretching back through the centuries. So on the one hand, these occult sciences are considered regular, if not central. Sometimes there are elements of religious curricula and, and the religious training of many scholars and in um, many parts of the Muslim world. It's not unusual. They're not unusual in one sense. But on the other hand, I did that. Do you see what I did here with the hands? I did palmistry on one side, right hand and left hand. On the other hand, you, you have a notion of what's hidden, hidden causes, which means that they must be unusual. There must be a notion of ordinary and there must be a notion of hidden or unusual in order to classify these as they are classified as strange or unusual sciences. So there has to be a notion of how things usually work in which the causes are obvious and open and which when anyone can understand and master and we do in our everyday lives, and then there are these sciences which are special, that have, that have special skills attached to them, and the causes for which are esoteric. They're hidden. You can't see the cause of a particular event. So um, uh, the, 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 the way in which occult practices have become sort of ingrained within Muslim intellectual practice can be summed up by a quote from this uh, very good work by uh, James Pickett called The Polymaths of Islam, published, uh, I think, last year, maybe the year before. And he emphasizes the link, if you like, between medicine and occultism in the traditions of Islam. So like medicine, occultism was an elite practice, not mastered by everywhere, everyone. Somewhere between two and five percent of the scholars of mid 19th century Bukhara in Central, um, in Central um, uh, Asia were occultists, a figure roughly on a par with medicine. There was an un, it was an unproblematic, respectable skill for the scholars of Islam, says Pickett. And that has been the story of much of the engagement with occultism uh, through history. Uh, in terms of uh, different scholarly structures at different points in time. And hence, there is a sort of ambiguous position for magic in the Islamic intellectual tradition. And there's a slippage, if you like, between sihr, the term I've been using, which is normally used for evil or black magic. And this is the type of magic which is controlled within the Islamic legal context. And al alum al strange unusual sciences um, in which you uh, in which the or, the out of the ordinary is described so turning now to the evaluation of magic in books of islamic law these are books of islamic jurisprudence and this is where i um, uh, spend a lot of my time reading these books and trying to work out what people are saying the the genre of islamic jurisprudence as a whole is called fiqh and in books of fiqh you will find a description of the actions which a pious Muslim should perform in order to make themselves an obedient servant of God. That is, it's rules and regulations for every area of human life because the Sharia, the law which was given to the humanity through the Prophet Muhammad, according to Muslim belief, is a law for every element of human life there is no area of human life and uh, community life and human existence that God is not interested in and for which 
there is there is a there is not a rule. There is rules for every single area of human existence, and this is why books of FIP cover. Uh, first of all, they're very large <laughs> when they when they fill out all the rules because they cover every area of human life, but also they're aiming to be comprehensive um, uh, and be a guidance. Of course, each work of fiqh is the laws of that God has revealed according to the opinion of the author of that book. But I'm going to talk quite generally, um, running through some of the general trends around the position within these books uh, concerning magic. Trying to answer the following questions. What have they got to say about sihr? What do they say about magic and what do they say about sihr? Is it forbidden? And if it is forbidden, is the magician, known as the sahir, is he outside of Islam? Is he accused of unbelief? And what might his or her punishment be for being a magician? And if it's permitted, can you earn money from sihir? Is sihir a legitimate form of uh, employment? Uh, can you sell your spells? And can you do this on a consultancy basis? There's also a discussion about whether sihir is real or not. Does it have any real effect? That is, when someone makes the spell, does it actually have an effect on the person who comes under that spell? And if it does have a real effect, is the magician responsible in some way for the effects of his or her magic? That is, if they cast a spell and they do damage through casting that spell, are they under the law responsible for um, compensating the victim for the, for the damage that they may have caused? These are the sorts of things which are discussed in works of FIP or Islamic jurisprudence in order to understand the position of sihr. And I'm going to be leading you through a particular work um, by Muhammad ibn Hassan Atusi, an 11th century jurist, um, uh, and his Kitab al Khilaf. I'm going to do this primarily because um, I like this book very much. <laughs> it's a very, very clear elaboration of the different opinions of different schools and different thinkers in the Islamic tradition up to his point. So you get a very clear idea of what the different schools think and what the different opinions might be on um, a particular issue. And he has a section on sihr, on magic. And it's on, it's, if you're interested, it's in volume five, page 327 onwards, in which he discusses a number of questions relating to magic and its role in Islam. And I'm gonna sort of use this as my guide text to lead you through the questions which I, which I said at the beginning. First question, is sihr forbidden? Well, the majority opinion is that sihr is indeed forbidden. And what do they mean by this? Well, it seems that most jurists, when they say that sihr is forbidden, they don't mean all forms of magic. They mean evil forms of magic, magic which are designed to do harm and uh, which are targeted at um, uh, innocent victims. And does this mean all forms of magic? For some jurists, all forms of magic are forbidden, but most of them hide behind this term sihr, which is understood to mean only those forms of magic which are for nefarious purposes. So it's a limited form of uh, prohibition of sihr, in the sense that it's only sihr which is, which is considered evil. And for some people, the only form of magic which is evil is sihr. Other forms of magic are permitted. So there's a debate around terminology. Anyone that thinks that sihr is permitted says this is, this is what uh, our author says in his book, uh, Tusi says in his khilaf. Anyone who thinks that sihr is permitted is an unbeliever and, and should be killed. And there's no dispute about this. So if you were someone who says that you believe sihr to be permitted, you are, you, have, you are an apostate from Islam. And in the medieval period, apostates from Islam were subject, in theory, according to the law, to capital punishment. Then there is a debate. 
And what you will find whenever you look at any Muslim um, works on uh, Islamic illegal um, Islamic jurisprudence, you will find that there's there's debates upon debates upon debates. There is hardly ever a single opinion on any question. So the majority opinion was that anyone who does not think that sihr is permitted, but says, but I do practice it, is a miscreant and he should not be killed. So someone, so that let's be pre precise about what we mean here. We mean someone who doesn't think that sihr is permitted. He's not arguing that sihr is allowed, but almost like a, uh, uh, someone who can't resist temptation. He says, I do actually practice sihr. I don't believe it's permitted, but I do actually do it. What about that person? The majority per the opinion within this book is that that person should not be killed. That is that he's not guilty of, of thinking sihr is permitted. Now this is interesting because it reveals something about Islamic law generally, which is it's more important that you believe sihr to be prohibited than you actually don't practice it. That is that you have to get your belief in what is the true nature of God's commission to us correct and there's a recognition that you might fall short in fulfilling those requirements so it's more important that you believe siha to be forbidden than it is whether you practice it or not or not whether you practice it or not and that is the majority position the majority position according to to uh, our author atusi and i would say that I would I would say that that's that's probably correct. The majority opinion is that um, it's a it's bad to practice magic, but it doesn't make you an unbeliever. The thing that makes you an unbeliever is believing that it is permitted. There is though a minority opinion. Every magician is a heretic if he puts it into practice and if he says but i don't think it's permitted like the person in the first opinion he says his word is not accepted and he cannot repent so there is a minority opinion that a magician even if the magician believes that magic is not permitted but still practices it is a heretic and deserves to be put to death so you have a variety of opinions and then you have another question. What happens if the magician says, I know about magic, I like it, but I don't practice it. According to the majority opinion, nothing can happen against him. Because once again, he hasn't said that magic is permitted. He said he's liked it, but he doesn't say it's permitted. There is a minority opinion which says that he is a heretic and has confessed to being a heretic and he should be killed and he cannot repent. He cannot, re repentance will make no difference to whether or not he faces the punishment. Tusi then presents his own argument. We argue as follows. This is what he says at the end of this section. The presumption here is that the ordinary citizen has protected blood, by which he means he should not be killed. And the one who wants to say that he no longer has this protected blood, i.e. the minority opinion, must produce evidence. And by this he means that just liking magic is not evidence of thinking it's permitted. It's evidence of having a misguided sense of what you like or what you approve of. It's not the same as thinking that it's permitted. People like lots of things that are sinful. In fact, most of, many pleasurable things also happen to be sinful but it's not evidence of thinking that they're actually permitted and it's thinking that it's permitted that is the problem and this is the same with sihr next question is sihr real does it have any real effect this is uh, in the A A arabic text hallahu hakika does it have any reality and here again, there is a majority opinion. The, the majority position is that it, it is real. That is that the majority of Muslim thinkers in the legal tradition and outside of the legal tradition have believed that magic has effects. That is that it is real 
And that's the same for most Shiites and for most Sunnis. Tusi, who, we're, who I'm citing from here, is a Shiite. And, um, uh, and most Shiites, he says, this is the, the view of the majority of, of my colleagues, i.e. My, my fellow Shiites, and most of the Sunnis, is that uh, magic is real. It actually happens. Sihr has effects in the world. There is a minority opinion that it's not real. And this is attributed to uh, a school of thought known as the Mu'tazila. And the Mu'tazila um, believed that um, if you were to say that an individual can change reality through magic, you are saying that they have some form of divine power. And something that the Mu'tazila were very, very strict on was, and was not allowing any leakage, if you like, of divine power outside of the Godhead himself. There can be no divine power outside of God's actions. So as soon as you allow um, a, a, a magic or sihr to have any effect, you're diluting that for the Mu'tazila and they, and they rejected it. And they said, sihr cannot be real. Because if it was real, it would... Um, it would compromise God's omnipotence. The majority position then is that it's near, real. And this is the quote which, is, um, which, which I, I cite from uh, Tusi here. It is real and it consists of knot tying, of spells. This is, knot tying was a practice. It's mentioned in the Quran, uh, a magical practice, which people who tie knots and then uh, are able to cast spells through tying knots. Spells. Someone is subjected to sihr and he is killed or becomes sick or is disabled in the hands or he is separated from his wife. It can happen that one does sihr in Iraq on a man in Khurasan and he is killed. This is the view of most of the people of knowledge, the Ahl al-Ilm. Those who say it's not real and that it's just meant that, uh, those, who, those who say it's not real and that it's just mental deception and trickery, they are surely mistaken, he says. So, if you believe that sihr is real, what about the effects of the magic? That is, that in Islamic law, um, if someone does damage to another person, they are liable for compensation in some form or another. There were a series of rules about this, I don't need to go into them here, but the principle is, is laid out very clearly. If you do damage to something else, you have to pay a form of compensation to the owner. Now, if you do that through magic, are you still liable for the compensation? This is the legal question. It's discussed in the sections on liability in, in works of Islamic law, which shows you, if you like, the normalness of uh, magical practices. Is that they are in with lots of other cause and effect mechanisms whereby people might be responsible for actions. But magic is seen as one of the potential ways in which people can become responsible for the actions that they do and therefore have to pay compensation if it is necessary. The first opinion is that even though magic is real, the magician is not responsible for the effects. If he casts a spell and the person that he casts the spell on dies, there's no legal responsibility for the individual. There's a second opinion that magic is real. So the magician is responsible for the effect. If he casts a spell, he has to face the punishment for killing the individual by magic. Now, when I read this, I thought opinion one makes no sense. If you're going to believe that magic is real and you believe that it actually has effects, then you're going to have to accept the fact that if someone casts a spell, against the person and the person dies, then you, the magician has legal responsibility and should be paying the compensation or the price or facing punishment for that. But the people who hold this position, the position that he shouldn't, um, he shouldn't be punishment, they have a logic to their position, which, which digging deeper into the text sort of makes sense. They argue this way, sometimes magic works, i.e. the person dies, and sometimes it doesn't work and he doesn't die. Magic isn't 
doesn't work every single time. It sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So the efficiency of any individual act of magic is unpredictable. The causal link, i.e., is in doubt. The causal link between the act of magic and the magic uh, and the and the effects is in doubt. Therefore, that causal link is in doubt. We cannot say that the spell killed the person. We haven't reached the threshold, if you like, for the um, for the responsibility to be established. So the point here being, of course, that uh, magic works, but not all the time. You know? So you can say that magic is real. It is actually real. It does work. But some people are better at it than others. And some people it's more effective than others. And the result is that you can actually hold the magician responsible, even if the person dies. Because it may have been an occasion where the spell didn't work. They've got another argument as well. They say that what if we could establish that the magic worked in this particular occasion, i.e. he died because of the spell. Now, if you can demonstrate that he died because of the spell, I don't know how you would do this, by the way, but let's say you could, you could demonstrate that he died because of the spell. What would be, surely then he would have responsibility. No, they say, uh, it, it, still he's not responsible because when he uses this spell, which he casts on this individual, he is using a weapon which is not consistent in its effect. And the analogy they use is sticks and knives. So in Islamic legal um, rules around uh, punishment for, um, uh, for murder, um, if you attack someone with a stick, um, the intent to kill is much more difficult to establish because sticks don't normally kill people when you poke someone in the, st in, the, in, the, in the chest with a stick. A stick is an implement which is not designed to kill and sometimes it will kill and sometimes it will not kill. A knife, and by that they don't mean a kitchen knife, they don't mean your sabatier downstairs, they mean a, uh, a, a knife as in a, uh, a dagger, a knife is an implement which is used to kill. And it does normally kill when you poke someone in the chest with it. Therefore, if you attack someone with a knife, the threshold is reached. If you attack someone with a stick and the person died, we could be talking here about, about um, some sort of homicide, some sort of uh, manslaughter, or even some sort of um, intent to cause bodily harm but not intent to kill, even though the person died. This works with the, with the, um, with the uh, spell because a spell is more like a stick than a knife. Sticks can kill people, but they don't always. Spells can kill people, but they don't always. So therefore, if a stick is not, if killing with a stick is not a reason for full responsibility for murder. That is that you don't face the full punishment for murder, but you face a lesser punishment for, um, for, uh, um, for uh, intent to injure but not kill. Then, um, if a spell is more like a stick, then you can't hold the magician responsible, even if he's successful in killing the individual. Sometimes even using a stick, intent is not proven. So using a spell may not demonstrate and establish the intent to kill the person. Another minority opinion is that magic is not real, but the magician is responsible for killing the person. I read this and I thought, now this really is a wacko opinion. You don't believe that magic is real, but a magician is still responsible if he casts a spell and kills a person through that spell. How does this even work logically? I had to dig through the text in order to try and find out the reasoning for this. And here it is. Magic is not real. Magicians are very skillful. They make it appear that the effect comes through unexplainable means. That's the point of magic. It doesn't appear like there's an obvious cause and effect 
but there but you're trying to claim as a magician magician that there is a cause and effect actually when things happen by magic they're happening they're by explainable reasons if this is, if you believe that magic is not real this is your explanation for the phenomenon of magic they're more like the magicians that we see uh, in um uh doing public performance today yeah david blaine type people they are they they're not actual magicians they're not actually doing magic what they're doing is they're doing things which appear to be magic but they're not magic the trouble is that in english we've allowed the term magic to describe what they do but actually what they're doing is they're faking magic they're not actually doing magic i don't think so anyway um, don't hold me to that maybe they are doing magic but i don't know but anyway we always trying to think what how do they actually work it out it actually is explainable they say and that's the norm with the thing which they call magic that is magic is not real they try and make it look as if it's supernatural therefore if the magician did a spell and the victim died there is a very high likelihood that he killed him by some means other than magic because that's what magicians do they have effects and make it look like it's supernatural but in fact it's real they did something else there was a trap door there was this that or the other which meant that it happened so they're tricksters but they do that the effects are real therefore if he cast a spell and the person died the chances are he did something else Sticks versus knives is used again. The trickster, the trickster um, does magic. The trickster's magic is like a knife. It normally works. It's not like a stick. A good trickster will always have an effect from his magic. It's not mag. It's not supernatural, but it is an effect. From all of this, you can see that there's a lot of discussion in Islamic law, and I won't go into any more detail about it. But it's great fun. And it's very interesting, and it involves some very interesting pieces of argumentation, which deserve to be, I think, um, uh, better known and uh, 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 and understood the different trends and within uh, the Islamic legal tradition. But what I wanted to do in the last part of my talk was talk about an actual uh, an actual magician, or at least someone who practiced magic. And this is someone who I've been doing a lot of work on. And um, part of the reason why I've got interested in magic in, in the Islamic legal tradition is because of this thinker, Mirza Muhammad Nisaburi. Now, Mirza Muhammad Nisaburi, he was born in 1765, we think, in India. And, and around about the age of 20, he leaves India with his parents on pilgrimage. Now, you can see I've gone really high tech here. I've got a map and I've drawn some co pretty colours on it. OK, to try and demonstrate his travels. Um, since I've done this map, actually, um, I found out that it's probably wrong. So that's a bit of a downer. But um, in 1785, when he leaves for India, he probably does not go up the Persian Gulf, but he probably goes. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, I don't, uh, you probably can't see this on the um, screen, but he, he goes south through the uh through the Yemeni pass here and up the um Red Sea and probably lands and goes to uh, Mecca and Medina the um the places where uh, devout Muslims go on pilgrimage at least once in their lives um um that way so in 1785 he leaves India on pilgrimage after doing pilgrimage he returns and in Muscat which is um, where the um, uh, blue and red lines meet on the Persian Gulf, his parents die. So he has gone on pilgrimage with his parents and they both pass away in Muscat. And he decides that he's going to take them to be buried in the shrine cities of southern Iraq, where Shiite Muslims often take their um, relatives to be buried. It brings a particular blessing to be buried close to the graves of the holy saints of Shiism. He goes to a place called Najaf in southern Iraq, which is where the red line ends in uh, Iraq, uh, or roughly there. 
and he stays there studying for some time. In 1796, around about 10 years later, he relocates to Tehran in Iran. And when he's there, he um, uh, ingratiates himself with the Shah of Iran at the time, um, Fat Ali Shah. At the same time, Russia and Iran break, uh, go to war as Russia starts to invade Iran from the north along the Caspian Sea coast, which you can see just at the top of the map here. And uh, in a minute, I'll describe how he get in, gets involved in that war. Uh, and that's where he uh, manages to do his most famous act of magic. Um, he's involved in a number of public debates because he holds a series of opinions um, about the way in which people should interpret Islamic law, which are deeply unpopular and against the orthodoxy which has emerged in Iran. And he gains a lot of enemies. And in 1810, he's forced to leave Iran and he go goes to Karzimain, which is a small village outside Baghdad in Iraq, where there is a big shrine to um, uh, uh, two very important saints within the Shiite tradition. He lives there in Karzimain, writing and composing works and studying and gathering a group of um, uh, scholars around him. And in, 18, in February 1817 or in January 1818, it's not clear yet, he is, because uh, some of the sources are contradictory on this, he's killed by a mob in Baghdad. And they storm his house and kill him and, um, uh, and kill a number of his uh, relatives who are there uh, and a number of his students who are studying with him. So he leads a reasonably controversial life. It's not usual for scholars to end up um, either the subject of um, public disgust, having to leave um, one city for another and eventually having schemes against them such that a mob rises against them and they get killed. So he's an interesting chap. There's no doubt about it. He wrote an enormous amount. His, I've got over 170 works credited to him so far. Um, and um, most of the works are not to do with magic. I have to say that. Most of the works are to do with the revival of, of uh, what he sees as his chance to revive the school of thought known as the Akbaris. They were textualists. They didn't believe in, 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 in using interpretive tools to understand texts, the texts of revelation. They believed in just taking the texts and understanding them as they were written on the page. And they didn't believe in scholarly reasoning. And they really pushed adherence to the textual sources of the law and not straying beyond the, what the textual sources say. And this, this is against the new orthodoxy which has emerged, which encouraged this level of reasoning and interpretation. And he's, he embarks on a whole series of, of vitriolic attacks against this new orthodoxy, describing the, the, you know, decrying the authority of the opinion of the qualified scholar, because the, the, the people he is fighting against believe that scholars who are qualified have the right to interpret the texts. His position is that the scholars do not have this right to interpret the text. On the right hand side, you see a manuscript of one of his works. And interestingly, you see that in a number of manuscripts of his works that he is so unpopular that sometimes his name is rubbed out from the manuscripts which we have of his works that 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 scholars have decided and you to who are who are copying them or who are preserving them to erase his name because he's become so unpopular. You see this in a number of, it's the only explanation I have for this, this phenomenon which happens in a number of texts which, which are um, uh, of uh, Mirza Muhammad Nisaburi. But then we have his involvement in magic. And he wrote a large number of magical works. And he wrote two encyclopedias. Uh, a, a, a folio from one of them is on the right hand side, the Dawa'id al Alum which is an encyclopedia of spells, different ways of doing geomancy and numerology and letterism. It's a, it's a fascinating work, which um, I'm yet to fully understand in all of its detail. And the Dhekhirat al-Albab, which is another encyclopedia, which I haven't seen, uh, but I, I am told it exists in manuscript, which I must um, travel to Iraq in order to see. 
And then we've got other works of man of, on magic, many of which are dedicated to the gentleman on the right, who is Fat Ali Shah, who was the Shah of Iran at the time and who I mentioned before. You've got books on spells and amulets, and you've got a, a real interest in numerology and letterism. That is the mechanism whereby letters and numbers can have special mystical meanings, um, whereby you can um, arrange them in order to protect yourself from evil, but also um, predict the future and also cast spells upon other people through arrangements of letters and numbers. When he's in Iran, as I said, mentioned earlier, he ingratiates himself with Fat Ali Shah, the Shah of Iran. And Fat Ali Shah is facing a threat from the north. And in, two, in 1806, when he's facing uh, a particularly um, uh, uh, forceful onslaught from the Russian forces in the, in the north of Iran, under the leadership of Pavel Tsitsianov, the Russian general, um, Mirza Mohammed promises Fat Ali Shah that he'll bring the head of Tsitsianov within 40 days. Tsitsianov was a real person. We know from the Russian sources that he was a real person. This is, his, uh, this is a portrait of him. And Fat, uh, he makes a dark bargain with Fat Ali Shah. If he successfully brings the head through magical means of Tsitsianov to Tehran, um, in 40 days to the Shah's palace, he will make Mirza Muhammad's school of thought, Akbarism, the religion of Iran. So that's his deal with the, the Shah. And he retires to the shrine south of Iran known as Shah Abdul Azim. And he locks himself in a room and he performs magical incantations in that room which included making wax dummies of Tizianov and beheading them, uh, pictures of Tizianov on the wall and throwing stones at them, and in a voodoo-like manner, attempting to bring about the downfall of Tizianov. And on day 40, lo and behold, Tizianov's head arrives in Tehran from the front. Mirza Muhammad Akbari, uh, Mirza Muhammad Nisabori has fulfilled his side of the bargain and he turns to the Shah expecting Akbarism to become the new religion of Iran. His school has been victorious over the, the, old, the, um, the orthodoxy. But a group of scholars make a petition to Fat Ali Shah and say, look, the people here cannot cope with this form of religion which Mirza Muhammad is promoting. It will be a disaster for you and your reign if you allow his school of, of thought to become the orthodoxy in Iran again. And the Shah is persuaded by this and forces, according to some reports, forces Fatali Ali Shah to leave Iran. And the enemies, his enemies, who are known as the Usulis, reassert their control. And Mirza Muhammad is expelled from Iran. He goes to Baghdad where he sets up as a uh, independent scholar, but he still faces the scheming of the Usuli ulama, the Usuli scholars against him. And they join forces, they are, these are Shiites, and they join forces with the, the Sunni Pasha of Baghdad in order to try and um, uh, uh, force Mirza Muhammad out of business and, and to try and um, uh, silence him. Ultimately, they managed to get from one of the leading scholars of the day, the, the ulama managed to get from the leading, one of the leading scholars of the day, a fatwa on request from Sheikh Musa, which says, what does the proof of God, this is a, an honorific name for the, uh, um, the great scholar of the day, Muhammad al-Mujahid, what does the proof of God amongst his creation and his security on earth? Think about the man who agitates against pious scholars and tries by killing them to extinguish the light of religion. And by this, he's talking about Mirza Muhammad and his spells against the, um, his enemies. Underneath this, Musa wrote, it is obligatory on every devotee and person of wealth to expend himself and his wealth in killing him. And if he does not do so, then prayer and fasting is not valid for him. That is that if you don't aim to kill such a person, then your ritual duties are not valid in, the in front of God. 
and thereby he would there he would thereby occupy his rightful place in hell. Armed with this fatwa, according to the reports that we have, the Usuli ulama agitate a mob, and they um, attack him in his house, which was close to the shrine of Kazimain. This is a picture from the mid nineteenth uh, century, so roughly about thirty years after Mirza Muhammad was killed. So it, it probably looked similar to this. During this, they 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 raided his house. They killed him and many of his followers, and um, he was buried in Kazimain um, as his body was smuggled out um, uh, uh, and, uh, away from his enemies. This is what Kazimain looks today. One can see in the story of Mirza Muhammad how magic was not only an established discipline within the Islamic circles, it was also a controversial discipline. It, was followed legal controversy and also it was attractive to political power. You have a strange sort of um, elitist and exclusive set of skills which belong to particular types of people who are revered and reviled in equal proportion uh, amongst the scholarly elite. And Mirza Muhammad's life sort of reflects that to an extent. And um, and his is a case study, if you like, of the dangers of when scholars become most public and use magic as a, uh, a mechanism for suppressing their opposition and the reaction of that opposition um, in terms of the political powers of the day. So I hope I've managed to introduce you to some of the intricacies, if you like, of the position of magic within the Islamic legal tradition and the Islamic tradition more broadly. And in particular, what happens when scholars um, go public, if you like, with their, uh, their devotion to magic and try and use magic for political ends. It's a controversial business. And I leave you with a picture from Mirza Mohammed's Book of Spells. Um, and uh, uh, in one of the uh, books, um, not on this page, but on other pages, I did find a spell which, uh, which said to make people believe what you say and to discredit your opponents, take three handfuls of corn and mix it with chicken blood and then wipe the mixture in a circle and stand in the circle when you speak. And that's what I've been doing for the last 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Glebe. <laughs>